The next speaker is Dr. Daniel Costa. He's an assistant professor of radiology at UT Southwestern and a member of the body MRI uh, division. His area of uh, interest, clinical area of interest, is prostate uh, MRI, prostate cancer, imaging in general, and the uh, use of MRI to characterize prostate cancer and to better diagnose prostate cancer. Uh, I think to say that will be to undermine his role, the role he plays in the, in the radiology department. He's the leading force of the prostate imaging program, which is, it has been a great uh, success at UT Southwestern, mainly because of his leadership and the great partnership with the urology department. Uh, so the title of his uh, talk is Multiparametric MRI and MRI Transfusion Biopsy, a New Paradigm in Prostate Cancer Diagnosis. Daniel. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Pedroza, for the kind introduction. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here to talk about this uh, topic that is near and dear to my clinical and research interests. Uh, it was great to have this uh, uh, introduction of PSA, which usually will precede an MRI of the prostate by Dr. Horenborn. So uh, I have no disclosures. And in keeping with the uh, symposium's objectives, uh, among many of the things that we're going to discuss uh, in the next 15 minutes, hopefully at the end of uh, this presentation, we're going to have emphasized the value of, sorry, the value of uh, multiparametric MRI and targeted biopsy. When to order uh, these uh, uh, procedures, this exam and this procedure, and uh, how to handle the MRI results if you choose to order uh, an MRI for your patient. But before we get to those, a uh, few items that are important for us to uh, cover. The first one is why MRI? So when we're talking about the prostate gland itself, uh, there are essentially three modalities that we can use to see the prostate. Uh, those being the CT, the ultrasound, and the MRI. CT and ultrasound, although we can see the prostate, we unfortunately cannot distinguish normal tissues from cancer. Uh, and as an example, a real life example, we can look at this cross section of uh, axial image of the uh, prostate. So here we're cutting the prostate as if we were cutting a salami. We have an, an axial view of the prostate. And we do see the prostate well, and you see this slightly heterogeneous texture. But if I'm asked to trace where a tumor is here, I would have a really hard time. And uh, uh, in this exact same patient, in this exact same plane, if we get the MRI that this patient had, this is what the dynamic contrast enhanced images look like. So pretty unequivocal that there is an abnormality here uh, that needs to be targeted during a, a subsequent biopsy. The other item that uh, frequently is a matter of, of uh, questions is the patient preparation, and that is in, in, not, in no significant way different of what a patient would be asked to uh, prepare if he, he were having a regular MRI of the pelvis, except for two things. One is we ask the patient to refrain from having uh, any sexual activity for three days so that we maximize the distension of the seminal vesicles, which helps us stage a tumor locally if there is a tumor. And the second is a fleet enema uh, two hours before the exam, just so that we don't have uh, a, a full rectum that would make the endorectal coil uh, more uh, uncomfortable. We frequently refer to the MRI of the prostate as a multiparametric MRI of the prostate. And what this uh, complicated word means is essentially that we use different parameters, different proof sequences combined to come up with an assessment of what is our perceived likelihood of a focal lesion being a clinically significant cancer. Uh, and uh, finally, the endorectal coil. So as, uh, uh, as it was already mentioned here, we use the endorectal coil as our standard protocol. Uh, we and other groups have shown that it not only improves the image quality, but also improves our ability to differentiate normal tissues from uh, prostate cancer. Now, one of the motivations for us to talk about the importance of MRI in the detection of prostate cancer is the short the shortcomings of the uh, traditional diagnostic uh, workup. Uh, the 12, so-called 12, so 12 core systematic biopsy has this name because rather than uh, 
pursuing a targeted approach, what a urologist does during this procedure is sample the biopsy in a systematic fashion. So the base, mid gland, and the apex, both right and left sides with two cores from each of those uh, uh, sextants, totaling 12 cores. As you can imagine, uh, it is really easy to uh, understand why this approach can miss uh, significant cancer. If you look at a hypothetical patient with this tumor, uh, a large area of the prostate goes unsampled. So you can have a false negative biopsy that totally misses the cancer. You can have a situation where the tumor is undersampled, which would give you a uh, suboptimal idea of the tumor size and the tumor aggressiveness. You can have another situation where the tumor of interest is missed, but you do find a clinically insignificant cancer. Or ideally, what we want to achieve, and that's what we're talking about here, we, sample, we not only find the tumor, but we sample it in its entirety, giving you a good idea of the tumor size and how aggressive that tumor is. All right, so we talked uh, a little bit uh, about uh, MRI now. There are things that ultrasound is better than MRI. And those are the ability to provide real-time assessment and the cost, in other words, availability. So uh, when we uh, think about this, and some uh, clever people had this idea, why not combine the strengths of the two so that they complement each other? And that is, uh, what we call the MRI transrectal ultrasound fusion. By doing this, we can project the lesion that we saw with the MRI on the ultrasound and combine the real-time assessment offered by ultrasound, the diagnostic accuracy provided by MRI, uh, with the uh, cost effectiveness of ultrasound. How does this work? Uh, it is a multi-step process that involves uh, different people, uh, but once the patient is determined to have suspected cancer and is uh, referred to an MRI, the patient <laughs> undergoes the MRI. So in the MRI, we delineate the prostate boundaries. We identify a suspicious area and mark that area. Then on the day of the biopsy with ultrasound, the urologist does the same thing, delineate the boundaries of the prostate. And using a fusion software, that target that we saw with MRI is projected on the ultrasound screen for uh, uh, the targeted approach. And then the urologist can see where the, the needle passes went uh, and whether or not that area of interest was sampled. And then after the biopsy, when we have the results of the biopsy, we can integrate those results and see uh, whether there is cancer and where the cancer came from and, uh, and QA our MRI and QA our biopsy procedure. So as you can see, a multi-step process that involves uh, various disciplines. Then what's the value of MRI and target biopsy? The two main values that have been validated by several studies are the increased detection of clinically significant prostate cancer and the decreased detection of clinically insignificant prostate cancer, the tumors that, you'd better, that would be better left undetected. Uh, as we learned about this, the third major value of MRI would be the high negative predictive value. In other words, if you have a patient who, have, who has a negative MRI, chances of that patient harboring cancer, especially clinically significant prostate cancer, are extremely low. Uh, more than 90% of those patients would have, uh, do not have cancer, and of those 10% of the patients who have cancer, the vast majority would have small volume, low gleason score cancers that, again, probably would be better left on the Now, which patients, in which patients should you consider ordering an MR of the prostate? The, the big group is the patients with suspected prostate cancer, and, and this is a group that would include patients with elevated or rising PSA, or patients with abnormal digital rectal exam. The uh, uh, big exposition of MRI, and um, MRI became extremely popular in the patients who had this context, but had already had a truss biopsy that was negative then these patients would get an MRI, and then you'd have a target biopsy if, that pa if the MRI uh, were to show a suspicious area. Now, that, in that patient cohort, the MRI was so successful that uh, uh, people extrapolated this to biopsy-naive men, 
And again, because of the high negative predictive value, in other words, being able to say to the patient, you do not need a biopsy even though your PSA is 4.5 because your MRI was reassuring, uh, has been shown to be very impacting and very helpful for patient management. Now, because of the shortcomings of the 12 core biopsy that we've discussed, a lot of the men who today are on active surveillance, they were diagnosed using that flawed approach of the systematic sampling. So a lot of these patients that are on active surveillance, they actually harbor more aggressive or larger tumors than we thought by the time of their initial diagnosis. So uh, again, because of how MRI improves the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer, in patients who are considering active surveillance uh, by having results of a 12-core biopsy showing small volume, low Gleason score cancer, MRI can help you ensure that patient that that's all he has. Or if not, at least have a target biopsy that will give you a better pre-treatment or pre-active surveillance risk stratification. Once these patients enter active surveillance, if they have a clinical disconnect, the, abnormal, the digital exam uh, suddenly becomes abnormal or the PSA starts rising uh, unexpectedly, then they can also get an MRI to identify potential areas to be targeted during the subsequent biopsy. And two uh, uh, indications that are usually more in the realm of uh, the specialist, the urologists for stage and for post-treatment recurrence after prostatectomy or radiation therapy. Now, how do you order MRI of the prostate? It's pretty simple. All you need to do is order an MRI of the prostate without and with, it, and with an intravenous contrast. It's billed as an MRI of the pelvis. You don't need to worry about writing multiparametric or writing with indirect coil. You can, but you don't have to. This is an institutional uh, practice. So if you order an MRI of the prostate, your patient will get a multiparametric MRI of the prostate with indirect coil. Now, the endorectal coil is always uh, uh, is frequently a, 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 a topic of questions. Uh, the patients do tolerate it pretty well. Uh, just as a, uh, an anecdotal example, it's much more common for us to see patients refusing intravenous contrast than the endorectal coil. Uh, and we know that intravenous contrast gadolinium is a pretty safe uh, uh, drug. So, uh, but you, have, you play a role in this by priming the patient and uh, telling them uh, that uh, the endorectal coil is in his best interest, provides the, not only the best image quality, but also uh, helps us distinguish normal tissue from prostate cancer. Now, what do you do after the results? Uh, so uh, when we report uh, a MRI of the prostate, we use uh, the so-called PIREDS. It's an acronym for Prostate Imaging Reporting and Data System, very similar to BIREDS, which is used in the breast imaging world. Uh, in this report, we convey a, a score, a per lesion score, that is from one to five, one being, uh, we're gonna discuss a little bit in the next slide, but one being the least concerning end of the spectrum and five being the uh, other uh, end of the spectrum, extremely concerning for prostate cancer. An example of a report that I just got from a recent case, the impression of a report to say index lesion, 15 millimeters, pi reds, version two is score five, which would be again in the, high, in the highly aggressive end of the highly concerning end of the spectrum, centered at the midline apex transition zone, and no evidence of extraprostatic extension. Estimated prostate volume of 32 uh, uh, cc's. And again, just to emphasize the PIREDS scale, which is a scale for the presence of clinically significant prostate cancer, and by clinically significant prostate cancer, it would uh, relate to the uh, intermediate and high-risk categories that Dr. Hoenborn already discussed uh, previously. So one to five, one through five, one being highly unlikely, two unlikely, three equivocal, four likely, and five highly likely. Uh, this varies a little bit according to the each patient scenario and urologist preference and institution culture, but normally uh, three or greater would be considered uh, targets for a target biopsy. But again, this gives you, because it is a scale, and we know that the highest they score, the more likely it is that there is clinically significant cancer. This gives you an opportunity to tailor what the next step is according to the patient preference, the comorbidities, or what is his life expectancy, so it's an opportunity to provide individualized care. 
And how do you refer your patient for MRI transrectal ultrasound fusion biopsy? As we speak, we are implementing a system where you can order the MRI alone, or you can already uh, anticipate, the, by anticipating the possibilities after the MRI result is available, you can say MRI and targeted biopsy if applicable, or uh, the full package, which would be MRI plus targeted biopsy plus post-biopsy management, uh, thanks to our collaboration with urology and pathology. So in summary, uh, multi-parametric MRI of the prostate and targeted prostate biopsies improve the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. Expertise and close collaboration with you, urology, and pathology are required for optimal patient management. There isn't not a single day goes by when I don't pick the phone or call one of uh, either Dr. Hoenborn or one of the other urologists at UT Southwestern or the pathologist or I receive a phone call from them or I receive messages via Epic or email. Uh, and this is not an exaggeration. Every single day we interact and in a very meaningful way. Uh, so it is truly a team sport where this interdisciplinary collaboration makes a huge difference in helping uh, our and your patients. With that, I thank you very much for your attention.